it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. We talked about that a little bit in Sunday school um, as we've been going through the book of Isaiah and kind of applying it throughout the New Testament and looking this morning as well at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2 and Paul saying that the, the, the bulk of the gospel is that what? Everybody remember? Christ. Christ was crucified. Christ was crucified. The death, the burial, resurrection of Christ. That is the, the, the nutshell of the gospel. And you know, it's amazing that as we have spent the last six weeks, seven if you count the introduction, introductory message, looking at the shadow of Christ, focusing on the Christ and looking at the shadow of Christ in the Old Testament, how many portraits of Christ we've seen that God has been declaring in His Word. And, and clearly, I, I could go even more defined, and we could have looked at even more and more things that are there of Christ, and, and we'll continue to, to do that. We have spent the, the last so many weeks considering, then, Christ being the Creator, the, the Lord of creation, the Lord of the Sabbath. We've seen Him as the seed of woman, the Redeemer, the seed of Abraham, the Melchizedek and priest. And last week, we saw Him as the Lamb of God. And what powerful statements we've seen, if you... We're here, and if you remember, in all those things of Old Testament saints, before the days of Moses, before the days of of the the manifestation of the Word of God, remember that Genesis through Exodus, I'm sorry, Genesis through Deuteronomy, were written by who? Moses. I was waiting for someone to say God, and I was going to say yes, but literally who? It was Moses. Moses was the, the scribe that God used. And so all these individuals that we've been looking at already, they didn't have the Bible. They didn't have the Word of God sitting in their lap to read it. And so last week we considered the testimony of Jesus to Thomas. He said, you know, Thomas, you believe me because you've seen me. Blessed are those who haven't seen, and yet they what? They believe. And so you consider Job. He didn't have the Word of God. You know? And yet he said what? I know that my Redeemer lives and I'm going to see him face to face. Abraham, he didn't have the Word of God. He just had the presence of God. And God asks him, Go sacrifice your son. And so he gets up the next morning and goes, does, and goes and does it. Three days, thinking about it, on the way to Mount Moriah. And as they get there, as they leave the servants, Isaac looks up at his dad and says, Dad, we've, we, we've, we've got the fire, we've got the wood, we're missing a main ingredient here. Where's the sacrifice? And for Abraham to look at his son and say, My son, God will himself provide the lamb. And so again, as we discussed that, whether God's saying that he himself will be the lamb, whether he'll provide the lamb, it doesn't matter. The fact is, it's all one of the same. God will what? He's going to provide the sacrifice. And we saw then that truly he did. And his sacrifice was who? His only begotten son, Jesus Christ. What Abraham was asked and withheld from doing, God performed. And so we move on now in in our portraits of Christ, and our shadows of Christ, and we continue to look. And and today we want to look at Abraham's grandson. Now, this is kind of an aside here, just kind of a quick thing, but remember we've talked in time about the the concept of faith in your kids at times. You know that um, it's powerful in the life of that first generation believer, but a lot of times in the second generation it, it tends to lose a little bit because they don't know what they were saved from. Does that make sense? They see the faith in their parents. They hear of all the miracles that went on, and, and, and they're kind of there. But sometimes in that next generation, in that grandkid generation, they kind of walk away because all they see is what? Tradition. Does that make sense? It's not personalized to themselves. And I, I think a little bit is what we're going to see in Jacob today. We've read Genesis 28. We know Jacob is, is to be a master of what? Deceit. He's a master of guile. I mean, he is, he is equipped in the, in the, in the art of, of trickery. And, uh, and that's how he's getting his way here. And so we want to consider Jacob today, and we want to consider in his life, first of all, the call of God, as we looked at Genesis 28. Because remember, context here, okay, Jacob is what? He's on the run, okay? J- Jacob's on the run, okay? And so he he's comes to this spot, and we're going to come back to that in a moment, but he comes to this spot, where he can't go on any further, and so it just happens to be, it's a coincidence here, that he's stopping in this spot, okay? And so he stops in this spot, and he does, to me, a very interesting thing. I'm one who, when he sleeps, like to, and right now I'm in this hassle of trying to, because of 
tearing my, my rotary cuff years ago and probably arthritis or whatever, getting into it, I can't bring my arm up so much. But I, I like to sleep on my, my arm. You know, I like to have my pillow on my arm and my head on the pillow. Does that make sense? So it's kind of rough now doing that because I, I mess my arm up when I do that. So Jacob grabs a what? A rock. He grabs a stone. He grabs a rock. And he, and he puts his head down, and I'm thinking, man, this is just not comfortable, especially if I go to put my arm underneath that rock. I mean, this is, this is what, a, what a killer. So anyways, but he grabs a rock, and he, and he sleeps on this rock. And, and as he's sleeping on this rock, God initiates a call. Do you get it? God comes to him. Jacob is not running to God here. In fact, Jacob, if anything, is running from God. But while Jacob is, is fleeing his brother, is literally who he's fleeing from, right? He's, he knows that Esau is angry at him because he's, he swiped everything that Esau had. You know, he swiped the birthright and he swiped the blessing. And, and Esau's not really happy with his twin. And, uh, and so he's, he's on the lamb, if you would. We talked last week about the lamb, but he's on the lamb. And, and while he's there, God initiates this call with him. And he comes to him. In verse, um, in verse 13, let's look there. In fact, I'm going to start at verse 11. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun was set. And he took one of the stones that he placed and put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And then he dreamt, and behold, a ladder was set up in the heaven, and his top reached to the heaven. And there angels of God were ascending and descending. And behold, Yahweh stood above it. In, in the Hebrew, it could be beside it. Okay, That's the same word that is used um, in the the Ten Words of the Covenant, or the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other gods above me or before me. It's, it primarily is used as the word besides me. In other words, you shouldn't have any other gods. So this is that, that word. Then the Lord stood above it or beside it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Who came to who? God came to Jacob. What an incredible statement. Now, what's really interesting about this statement is that if you go back a couple chapters to chapter 25, go back to 25, look at verse 23. And God's, Yahweh speaking to Rebekah, his mom, and says, The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. So before Jacob, the younger, was ever born, God had already determined what? He was going to use him. He was going to be the one that he was going to use. Now, we can debate the predestination for knowledge thing. That's for a different day. Okay? The fact is that God had chosen Jacob. Jacob, in his life, was going a different way. But God still said what? You are my you're my man. And so God comes to Jacob and initiates the contact between earth and heaven, or heaven and earth, and he opened up the way between the two. This is important. What is the means of salvation? Faith. Okay? Faith. By grace. That is so important. Sometimes we forget that. It's by grace that you're saved through faith. Faith is meaningless. Now, hear what I'm saying. Okay, keep it in context. Don't, don't rip out this little part of the, the you know, sound clip here and, and say, Pastor Bob said faith is meaningless. Um, faith is meaningless if God's grace hadn't determined that that was the means of salvation. You could have faith in a potato. But that doesn't do anything for you, does it? You might make a good potato head, but it, you know, this is a really good potato. I'm going to make a good potato head out of this one. But it doesn't do anything for salvation, does it? You can have faith in your works, but clearly, that's not going to get you any place either. Why does faith in the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ get you to heaven? Because that's the means that God had declared would be the path. Does it make sense? God initiated it with us. We saw weeks ago that God created man and woman, but the next week we saw that man and woman decided what? 
They knew better. And they were going to choose the path of death rather than the path of life. So God made a way. God made the way. God initiated it. If God hadn't initiated, if God hadn't made a way, where would you be today? Nowhere. And you know what? There's a lot of people out there in the world today who have great faith. They just have it in the wrong object. The wrong thing. And that's a sad thing. So be careful when you talk about faith. Faith, faith. There's a lot of people who have faith, faith, faith. But it's faith in the means that God had um, established, and that is the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? That's the gospel in a nutshell. And God's the one who initiates it. Well, who did he initiate it with? It was with a what? With a sinner. Consider Jacob for a moment. Let's consider Jacob. He was a deceiver on the run. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I was his brother, I would be pretty upset too. Now, clearly Esau was a couple brick shides of a shy of a load in his brain. Okay? Um, and, he, and he gives guys a bad name. Okay? Right? I mean, <laughs> he comes in from the field, right? And he's what? He's starving. He's hungry. You know? He'll do anything for some food. He'll give anything for some food. And so, you know, Jacob was there in the position of bartering. He was the original American. And, uh, and so, he, you know, you know, supply and demand, right? Supply and demand. There's, there's, there's a great demand. I've got the supply. Right now, the price of my stew went up from 25 cents a, a cup to your birthright. <laughs> now, honestly, it's lentil stew. So the guy must have really been hungry to want to eat it. No, anyways. So, but he makes his soup, and he has it, and I'm sure the aroma of it was to, to Esau as just heaven itself. Clearly, he's that kind of a guy, brute kind of guy, and he comes walking in, and he says, I me want food, you know? And, 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 and Jacob says, oh, my brother Esau, I've missed you all day. Where have you been off to? You stink like an animal. Anyways, and so he goes on, right? And he says, I'll give you some of my soup. Oh, great. It'll only cost you your birthright. What? My birthright? You're nuts. Well, that's okay. I can eat all the soup myself. I might give some to mom and dad, too. And, you know, go your way. Find some food. I know. I'm embellishing here. That's kind of... Have you ever heard your sons talk to each other? Have you ever heard twins talk to each other? I've been there, okay? Especially when one has something on the other one. It's really... The, the bartering thing can really happen real well here, you know? And so, so this, this bartering goes on, and finally Esau says what? What good is my birthright if I die? Boy, how short-sighted we can be sometimes, isn't it? You and I are given a birthright in Jesus Christ. And how easy it is for us to sell it for a bowl of lentil soup, or even less. You know, we can pick on Esau. But ask yourself, what are you willing to exchange your birthright for? Or even more importantly, what have you exchanged your birthright for? And so he exchanges his birthright. Now I understand, that was the foolishness of Esau. But honestly, it was the conniving of Jacob as well. And then it doesn't stop there. We find out in, in, in later in that chapter where the conniving actually comes from. Where did Jacob learn his conniving? His mother. It's the woman. See? I mean, that, anyways, no, we won't go there. Anyways, again, that's right. Anyways, we won't go there. But s- clearly, in, 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 I'm trusting in your, your uh, hindsight being 2020 and knowing scripture here. Where did, because where did, we're going to turn this thing back around here. Where did Rebecca learn her conniving from? Her family. Jacob's going to go, and he's going to go work for her. Now, we're not going to get there today because it's not part of the story, but he's going to go work for the, the master of connivers. He's going to go work for Laban. And Jacob thought he was the big deceiver. Boy, he's going to get run over the coals. You know, the guy's going to get 14 years of free labor out of the guy. You know? And so, so Rebecca teaches Jacob how he can deceive her husband, his father, to get Esau's blessing. That's pretty low, isn't it? That's pretty low. I would that my kids will never do that to me. I mean, it's one thing to, to dupe a brother who really should know better. But to deceive 
a blind old man who happens to be your dad. That's pretty low. That, 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 that says a whole lot about Jacob's character, I think. Not to mention Rebecca's, but we're, the message isn't about Rebecca. <laughs> it's about Jacob. And so Jacob is a deceiver who's on the run. He's fleeing. He's fleeing for his life. And yet God, in his grace, despite the character of Jacob, chooses him. How many of you have been or are Jacob? I'm not asking for hands. Not that you want to put them up right now. (laughs) But in your life, you're Jacob. In James chapter 1, we read, Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own self. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, this man is like a man who looks in the mirror, he looks in the glass, he beholds himself, straightway he forgets what he looks like, and he goes his own way and forgets what man or man he looks like. But whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So many of us are deceiving, but we're really only deceiving ourselves. What about Paul in the New Testament? Again, you don't need to go there. You've got verses on your sermon. No cheat to go there. What do we know about Paul? Well, first of all, he declares himself to be the what? The chiefest of all sinners. Why? Because he was on the prowl. On the prowl against who? Christians. Not just against Christians then. Really against God. Because it was the work of God. Now, he may not have seen himself as going against the work of God, but he was. And so he was on the road to Damascus to try to drag the Christians back so they can be killed. He was living in opposition to God. He was kicking against the pricks. Now, where do we first see that? See Saul, who became Paul, at the stoning of Stephen. What was he doing? Holding the coats, guarding the coats of those who were going to throw the stones. He was giving his... Uh, consent, thank you, to the work that was going to happen. To the, to the destruction of one who was giving a bold testimony of Jesus Christ, who was his Messiah. That's a pretty powerful thing. And then he's going to Damascus to drag a whole lot of them back. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, regarding his own credentials, his own pedigree, he says that he was of the tribe, he was an Israelite, of the tribe of um, Benjamin, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was, he was circumcised the eighth day. And then he says, concerning righteousness, he was persecuting the church. He was persecuting, the, that was his righteousness back then. I mean, he was so living before God that he was persecuting the church. But in spite of his opposition, in spite of his fighting and kicking against God, God in his grace chose him. So I ask you, maybe it doesn't apply to any of you, are you kicking against God someplace here? Are you fighting against God? God is still a God of grace. Do you know people like that? Like Jacob? Who are just of rotten character. They may not be necessarily the deceiver, but it may be in in a different area of character. Maybe it's thievery. Maybe the person's a thief. Maybe he's a he's a drug addict or she's a drug addict. Maybe it's in promiscuity, um, uh, debauchery, bad character. What do we think? God's grace, I'm glad, is able to reach even to the chiefest of all sinners. I don't need to tell you about my other side of the railroad tracks. I don't need to tell you my experiences growing up, which were debased and defiled. I know what it's like to be on that other side of the railroad track. And I praise God that God doesn't look at character and he doesn't look at rebelliousness as a determiner of who he's going to allow to be a part of his kingdom. And I think we do well to have the mind of Christ 
when we go out to witness. We may not like the sin. God doesn't like the sin either. But he loves the what? The sinner. And we have to be able to look beyond the person's character and the person's opposition to see the soul that needs saved that God wants to have a relationship with. So, what about us? What has God saved us from? Secondly, and really of of greater impact to us right now, is the promise of God. Look again back at uh, chapter 28, right there at verse 13, where we were just reading. And it says, Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will what? I will give it to you. He doesn't say, in the, the land on which you lie, you will come to possess. He says, the land on which you lie, I will give it to you. Do, do you know the distinction between those two statements? The one where you will come to possess and the other I will give it to you? If it's you will come to possess, the potential is that you would have done it on what? In whose power? Your own. Your own. But God says, I will give it to you you. There's a promise that's being stated there. God is putting his word, his name, on the line. If God doesn't do that, then what does it say about God? He doesn't keep his promises. He's not a man, quote unquote, of his word. He's not faithful. But what do we know about God? He is. He is faithful. Look at verse 14. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, You shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south, and in you, and in your seed, now we already talked about the seed of Abraham, God's now bringing and honing that seed thing a little bit more. It's going to be youth, Jacob. In your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He doesn't stop there, though. It goes on. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. No strings attached. Wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. First of all, God promised his blessing to Jacob. God promised his blessing to Jacob. What an, what an incredible um, statement that, that God makes to him. I'm going to multiply your seed. It's through your seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed, and your seed is going to become like the the dust of the earth. I'm going to bless you. But then he goes on and says, I'm also going to what? I'm going to protect you. I'm going to be with you wherever you go. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, what do we know occurred at the moment that you... Trusted God through Christ by faith. What happened? You were sealed with what? With the Holy Spirit of promise. With the Holy Spirit of promise. Get it? I mean, it's, just, it's an awesome thing. Right now, is God with us? Yes. I'd like to think it's because of all of us, but I know that he's in me, and so therefore he's at least here. Okay? Now, I'm assuming that you all are saved, and so therefore, he's really especially present. Right? A lot of times we pray, what? And God be with us. I mean, I know, I, I know, we, you know what we're saying there, but the reality is, what? He's always with us. He's told us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he, tell, he reiterates to Jacob here. He says, listen, man, wherever you go, he doesn't qualify it. Now, again, sometimes, like Paul, we can preach grace and people say, well, then, should I continue to sin that grace may abound? And Paul says, no, God forbid. Okay? He doesn't qualify where he's going to go with you. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, don't you know when you join yourself to a harlot, you've just joined Christ to a harlot? Pretty powerful statement. If you don't think it's a place that God's going to go, why do you go there? Because guess what? You're taking him there. He's going to be with you wherever you are go. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, now I'm caveating here, right? If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you have by faith accepted that gift that he's offered you, 
then he's a man of his word, quote unquote, God of his word. When you're faithless, Paul tells Timothy, he will remain faithful. And God will always be true to his word. Therefore, wherever you go, he's going to go. But note the other part of that then, and I will what? I'll bring you back. I'm going to bring you back to the land. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will what? He will not depart from it. God is making a promise to those who are his. No matter where you go, even if you should stray, I will bring you back. Bible scholars, what is able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Nothing. How many things? Nothing. What about height? Depth? Principalities? Powers? Angels? Things present? Things to come? Sword? Pestilence? Nothing. Nakedness. That's right. Perils. Yea, in all these things we are counted as what? More than conquerors. Not because of ourselves, but because of God. Because he will not leave us nor forsake us. I don't know about you, but since I've been saved by his grace, I don't know how to share this because I know I'm a pastor and this would really ruin your image of me. I haven't been perfect. I know it, I know it. You think, Roddy, it's just because I, I follow the Steelers, so you think that's my greatest sin. But anyways, no. <laughs> But God in his grace will always bring us back. Do you get it? God's promise is not conditional. God's promise is faithful. God promises blessing. God promised his protection. And he will be true to those promises. As well, I want to look at the duration of those promises. Because this is really key. How long was this promise going to last? Anybody know? Look, look in the passage. Until when? Until I have accomplished, I've done all that, I have spoken to you. God says, I will continue to do it until I have accomplished my purpose in you. So, what's the purpose of God for us? Does anybody know Philippians chapter 1, verse 6? I bet you do. And he who began the good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. Ah, he who began the good work in you, he who initiated, get it? He who initiated the call, he who came into your life and presented the truth, that was God, he who began the good work in you will perform it till when? Until Christ comes, till the day of Jesus Christ. Until you enter into the presence of Christ. Whether it is you've died and entered into the presence of Christ, or Christ came and you entered into the presence of Christ. That until the day of Christ, God will continue the work in you. Whether or not you're doing it, he's going to do it. What do we know from Romans 8, 28 and 29? We know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose for whom he did foreknow he also did predestine that they may be conformed to the image of his son so what's God's purpose for you to be conformed to the image of his son to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ okay so God wants you to be perfected God wants you to be to look like inwardly like Jesus Christ and he says he's going to continue that work how long until Jesus Christ comes do you get it so why does he have to continue the work in you about perfecting you and, perf- and, and causing you to be conformed to the image of Christ? Because you leak. Because you're not it. That's exactly it. Because you do not look like Jesus Christ right now. You may think that you're pretty good. Hopefully not. Because after pride comes the what? The fall, right? Humble yourself in the sight of God and he will, he will lift you up. But the fact is that there's many who think that they got it. They're, they're, they're spiritual. They've got it down pat. They're the ones who have, 
have totally offered themselves as living sacrifices and, and they got it down. The sad thing is they, they got a long way to go to learn how far they still have to go. Now that doesn't mean that you may not have grown more and there's different levels, but the fact is as long as I'm on the earth, there's still more dross to be brought up and cleaned off. Does that make sense? Otherwise, I'm what? I'm perfect. And Paul says, not as though I were already perfect. Not as though I were already perfect or already have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind, my failures, the, the things that I, I trusted in, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forward to the things which are before, I press toward the mark. You know what's so fun about that word press there? It's the, in the Greek, it's the word dioko. And he had already used that word in Philippians chapter 3, and I've already shared that word with you in, in talking about him. It's the same word for persecution. When he said he persecuted the church, he pressed the church. It's kind of the idea. It's like a, a, a bounty hunter going after somebody. Paul said, with the same pursuit, the same zeal in which I pursued Christians, I'm pursuing Christ. Isn't that awesome? But all the while, Paul knows what? It's God who's doing the good work in me. And it's God who's going to be faithful to work in me to the day of Jesus Christ. Because that's his plan for me. Be encouraged. Let's slide to the prophetical side. As we look at this this interaction, because clearly this interaction, we're, we're looking at it because it's a portrait of Christ. And so, right away, I want you to turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And I want to read the, uh, the fulfillment, if you would, the, of this passage. The place where it comes into the play. Where Jesus himself says that this is a portrait of him. John chapter 1 is a long chapter. And we're going to be right at the end of it. At the end of the chapter. And I want to begin reading in verse 43 for the context, but we're really going to only talk about those last couple of verses there. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. In other words, see for yourself. I mean, you know, because I mean, honestly, it was a common saying back then, you know, about, about Nazareth. And, you know, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip really doesn't have any other response to that other than what? Just come see for yourself. I mean, you know, seeing is believing, right? Come and see. And so Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit or no guile. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabboni, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, you believe? You're going to see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open." And the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Nathaniel is under the fig tree, probably meditating on the Word of God. And chances are, he's probably meditating on what passage? Genesis 28. That's right. I mean, there's a reason why Jesus is is bringing up this analogy, not out of the blue. And so he says to Nathaniel, right off the bat, Aha, now here is an Israelite. What's an Israelite? A son of Jacob. Because Jacob's name became Israel. Okay? And so he says, now here is a son of Jacob, if you would. Here is an Israelite. Now he could have called him a Jew. That was a normal name, just Jew. But that refers to being of Judah, right? And so, um, but it became a generic term. Even those who weren't of Judah would be called Jews. But he calls him an Israelite. Now here is an Israelite of whom is no 
deceit, no guile. And so if he was meditating on his passage of Jacob, he would be considering the fact that Jacob was a man of great guile, you know, who God still chose to use. And so he said, ah, here's, a, here's an Israelite in whom is no guile. And so Nathaniel, you know, is probably struck by that. It's coincidence, of course, you know. And, uh, and he says to him, he says, how do you know me? You know, I'm still a what? I'm still doubting here. I'm still a little kind of skeptic here. How do you know me? And then Jesus says, now Nathaniel knows that nobody else is around. He's got his little corner that he's meditating in, right? And Philip has to go get him. And so he knows Jesus isn't there. And he says, how do you know me? And Jesus says, while you were under the fig tree, the place that you were lying, I saw you. Now, there's got to be something profound happening here. I don't want to read too much between the lines. But clearly, Nathaniel understood that Jesus just did something that wasn't human. That went beyond an ordinary man's capacity. And he responds straight from skepticism to what? To faith, to belief. Truly you are the Messiah, the Son of God. That's a pretty profound statement. Not just truly you are the Messiah, but he is a man who is learned potentially in the Scriptures, or at least it seems, because he understands the Messiah is going to be who? The Son of God. Jesus later refers to himself as what? The Son of Man. Isn't that cool? you got the deity and the humanity of Christ all together. And he says, truly you're the Son of God. And, and then, then Jesus says to him an interesting thing here. And he, and he, and he jumps right into this, this thing about the ladder. And so again, I think that Nathaniel probably is, is reading this thing. And he says to him, verse 50, he says, because, you saw, because, you, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see, now this is important here, you will see, you individually will see greater things than these. And then he said to them, then he said to him, most assuredly I say to y'all. Okay? If you've got a new King James or a modern kind of thing, you don't see it. If you've got a King James, does anybody have the King James authorized version? Okay, Don, does it say ye in, in verse 51? Does it, say, does it say, most assuredly I say to you, ye? Ye. It's y'all. It's plural. I mean, if you have a King James, if it says you, it's singular. If it says ye, it's plural. Okay? And so he says, most assuredly I say to y'all, hereafter y'all shall see heaven open and the angel of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Jesus now is making a very broad application here. Not just to, to Nathaniel. Nathaniel, you're going to see this. But he's saying it to, to everybody. Okay? And he says, and he equates himself here to this ladder of Jacob. And he says that you all are going to see heavens opened up and angels ascending and descending upon me. In your mind, go back to Genesis 28. What was the purpose of that ladder for Jacob? What, what did it indicate? Okay. What, when, when he woke up, what did he think? This is the place of God, man. I mean, he took, his, he took the, the rock, his pillow, <laughs> and, he, and he stood it upright. You know, we always think about that. You ever see pictures of these big things? He probably didn't have a huge rock. I mean, it was a small rock that he was using as a pillow. So he, he, he takes this rock, and he puts it, stands it upright, and he pours oil on it and anoints it and says, this is the house of God. He calls it Bethel, the house of God, right? And so he recognizes that, that heaven was opened up to him, and God had given access to himself there. Do you understand? That's what that ladder was. It was access to heaven. Angels were ascending and what? Descending. Do you understand the purpose of a... Uh, there's a mirrorism happening. Um, a li- mirrorism is a literary device where you, you use two opposite extremes to reflect everything in between. And so Psalm 113 says, Praise ye the Lord, praise ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. How long is the Lord's name to be praised? All day. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, in the Shema, we're, we're told that we're supposed to teach our children the... The word which we have memorized, right? That we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the words which Moses taught us this day, we're supposed to hide in our hearts, and we're supposed to teach them diligently to our children, whether we're sitting in a house or whether we're walking in the way, whether we're lying down or whether we're raised up. 
So no matter where you're at, whether you're at home or you're on the road, no matter what time of the day it is, whether it's nighttime, remember it's evening and it was morning, so for the Jews, evening and morning, not day and then night. So for them, it's the opposite way. So whether it's the beginning of the day or the end of the day, you're supposed to be doing what? Teaching the Word of God. You're supposed to be living the Word of God. So a mirrorism is when you do that. So the angels were ascending and descending. What does it mean? It goes both ways. Do you get it? It's not just God coming down, heaven coming down to earth, but it, when, when that access is given, there's access from earth to heaven as well. This is so exciting. In Hebrews chapter 10, we're told that we can have boldness to access the throne room of God. How? How, though? Through the blood of Christ. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Do you get it? We have access. That Jesus is himself is the ladder. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's the ladder. He's the door. He's the way. He's the path. And so, that little illustration there in the bottom left, the, the cross, I, I wanted, I can't find one. I, I figured, man, there's got to be one out there. I, what, I, what I picture, I wanted to, you know, I had that previous one of Jacob's ladder with the, with the ladder there. I want one with the cross, with steps going up it. Because that's it. He's the ladder that allows you to have access into the heavenlies. And so we read in Ephesians chapter 2, that didn't turn out very well, did it? But um, trust me as I read it. It says, Ephesians 2 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of partition, or the middle wall of separation. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Jews, Gentiles, both together, coming by Jesus Christ to God. That's the access point. Acts 4, 10 to 12. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be same, saved. How many other names? Surely by the name of Allah. Surely by Muhammad. How about by, through Buddha or Confucius? How about George Bush? And we laugh. But the fact is, they're all what? Men anyway. They're all created by men. They're all human names. There's only one name under heaven given amongst men by which we must be saved. And it's by Jesus Christ of Nazareth. 1 Timothy 2, 3-5, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Only one mediator. That's it. No high priest, no pope, no father, no monsignor, no pastor. One mediator. It's Jesus Christ. Finally, Romans 5, 1 and 2, there are so many other, I mean, just, you could do the search of Scripture. You know, I, I mean, I could sit here for, for an hour just going through these verses. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, that's the ladder. The ladder is Jesus Christ. What about the angels, though? What, what about the angels? Well, angels are, biblically, messengers and ministers of heaven. Of God, specifically, but of heaven. We're told in the book of Hebrews that they're ministering spirits to who? To us. To saints. That's an exciting thing. Um, it was angels that God used to send the message to Mary and Joseph, yes? Yes. It was angels who were sent in the Old Testament to deliver messages. I know that there were points where there's the angel of the Lord, and we may think that that is the pre-incarnate of Jesus Christ, and it probably is. But there were other times when he sent angels to people to declare his messages. Almost all the time, those messages were sent to who? 
believers. Does that make sense? God gave Pharaoh a dream. God gave um, Abimelech a dream. God gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream. Okay? And it was debating upon whether those guys were believers or not. But none of them really had a what? An angelic experience. They got they had dreams. Okay? So I mean those are the, the, the ones I'm gonna be honest and just say throw those in there that you know that and then you got Balaam, who God spoke to Balaam. Okay? But when God sends a messenger, most of the time it's he's sending the messenger to his 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 saints. Yeah, that's true. Look at the book of Daniel. Daniel's the one who got the, the, the angelic messengers. Very good. And so consider then Jesus saying that I'm the what? I'm the latter. Okay? And he says, from here, from, from here on, you're going to see what? Angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The ministry of angelic spirits. What is the foundation? Jesus Christ. i got a challenge for you here. When somebody in the world claims to be touched by an angel who doesn't know Jesus Christ, is it true or false? This is a struggle. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, some may come with you with another Jesus, another gospel, or another spirit, and you may very well accept them. And then he goes on and he says, and such are, are false apostles, they're workers of the devil. This is no wonder, for Satan himself also transforms himself to be an angel of light. Therefore, it's no wonder if his, his workers also transform themselves and be ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their work. There are people out there who are workers of the devil, who come in what? Righteousness, with a gospel, in the name of Jesus, with another spirit. In today's, in today, there are a lot of people who talk about angelic beings. And oh, we, I mean, again, far be it from me to be judging somebody and their what? Their experience. Near-death experiences, angelic experiences. And I, I, I'm not God, okay? All I can do is go to the Word of God and try to base things upon His truth. Does that make sense? Jesus said, those angels are going to be ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The foundation, the throughway, is going to be Jesus Christ. Again, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you really believe it? It's harsh, isn't it? It's pretty limiting. And in, in today's vernacular, it's what? It's uh, um, My mind just went. The, the key word for today is you have to be intolerant. intolerant. That's the word. We are so intolerant. It's okay. So were they. Honestly, they are intolerant as well because they don't want you in the mix. Okay, So they're intolerant of your intolerance. These angels then. God has promised. Part of that, remember the, the, the protection? The blessings and the protection? Angels are what? Ministering spirits. God has promised that they will come, that he will use his angels as a ministering spirit in your life. I would venture to say, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have entertained angels unaware many times. You have received the ministry of angels in your life many times without knowing it. So, in the end, God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves you and sent his son Jesus Christ to die for you. Clearly, we know that the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So, he will be true to his call. Have you accepted that salvation? Have you accepted that free gift of God? If you have, if you have, 
then God is going to be what? He'll be faithful. If you haven't, you're not part of this blessing. It's not there. You only can go by the ladder. And I want to challenge you to do that through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the ladder, access to heaven. How often do you avail yourself of the privilege? For you as believers, that privilege is, again, as we talk about from Hebrews chapter 10, prayer. It's the opportunity to access the throne room of God without worrying about whether you're going to be received or not. The ladder is there. All you have to do is what? Walk it. Now, conclusion. Just a quick illustration from my past. One of my favorite groups growing up, I hate to admit this one, was Led Zeppelin. You know, I was a Zepp fan. And I knew, you know, Jimmy Plant and John Bonham and, or, uh, yeah, anyways, all those guys. Anyways, yes, Jimmy Page, thank you. And Bobby Plant, Bobby Plant and Jimmy Page, thank you. And um, anyways, they had an album called Zoso. Now, that may mean nothing to anybody. But now that I know Greek, I realized when I learned Greek um, how either these people were very theologically literate, biblically literate, or Satan was really using them because Satan is biblically literate. The word for salvation in the Greek is sozo, sozo, to be saved, sozo. The name of the album is Zoso. Isn't that interesting? It's a statement by itself. And on that album, there's a song. You, some of you know it. What was it called? Stairway to Heaven. Yeah, thank you. At least it makes me feel better that I'm not the only one. <laughs> there's a lady who's sure that all the glitter is gold, and she's buying a stairway to heaven. What do you think the analogy is all about. The world, well, not just wasting, no, it's, it's, it's using the analogy of Jesus Christ. But one of the sad things, and it brought it back in my mind, was, was the sad thing, it was a Christian site that was actually using a, a, a stairway to heaven, and they actually used a picture from the Zeppelin. I'm thinking, ah! anyways, um, anyways, whatever. God can use anything to sanctify it. Um, but, but the point is, that's the world. The world thinks that they can what? They can buy their way to heaven. The sad thing is believers sometimes, we talked about this in Sunday school, we forget that we can't buy our way to heaven. And so after we get saved, after we've got the access, we think what? Now we get further access by heaven by what? By works, by buying our way into God's presence. She is deceived. But we deceive ourselves, too, by ourselves. Again, it's still self-deception, thinking that we can earn our way there. And, and again, the righteousness of God is through Christ Jesus, whether before salvation and after salvation. It doesn't change. Our access to heaven is through Jesus Christ alone. No man comes to the Father. Get it? We're not talking about just salvation. We're talking about after salvation. No one comes to the Father except Through Christ. If you think that after you got saved, your works have been so awesome that you don't need Jesus Christ anymore, you're so wrong. You still have access by Jesus Christ. And this is something Bob works on in his theology all the time. You know? But we come to God through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you get it? It's not Bob alone. It's Christ alone. So I want to challenge you of availing yourself of that privilege. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your goodness to us. I thank you for the access that you have given to us, to yourself through Jesus Christ. You alone are God, and we give you the glory and the praise. Lord, help us to be faithful, to to come before your throne, to have that time with you, but Lord, as well, that we would be faithful as well as drawing others towards you, that we would be used by you in doing that, Um, that we would be faithful to open up our mouth, we would be bold, Lord, to proclaim your name. 
and that we would see others be able to, to get on the ladder to come to you through Jesus Christ for your glory. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.